there's something you miss in the study or you're wondering, well, I wonder what was right before that or coming back up before that, you can go on to the, the Facebook group and, uh, and look to see what's been taught before. I'm starting to post things like the, some of the life lessons and some of the other references, so uh, maybe it'll help, uh, help build you and encourage you in your study. So today we're reading from Gospel of John, the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, reading from the New King James Version translation. Last time we ended at verse 49 of chapter 1, so uh, it was with Nathanael's testimony. Nathanael's testimony about Jesus. Verse 48, Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Uh, last week we learned there was a lot more going on in those simple phrases that, that went back and forth between the two of them. There was a lot of background, and we, uh, again, I'd like to encourage you to review that if you, if you didn't get to, to study that. But uh, today we're going to start at verse 50, 51, and then go into chapter 2. John 1, 50, Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than this. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, Nathanael had recognized and proclaimed that Jesus was a great teacher, the King of Israel, and indeed the Son of God. He had just experienced the most incredible thing in his entire life. Um, you know, discovering who the promised Messiah was and meeting him in person, having him talk to him directly. I mean, that's pretty awesome. You know? I'm looking forward to, to meeting him in person, uh, in, in the physical, um, after, uh, after, after I pass through this life. But, you know, this was like fulfilling all of his hopes and dreams. He'd intensely, Nathaniel had intensely studied the scriptures for years and years. And, and now he'd personally seen the Christ's revelation in his life and, and, and the supernatural knowledge that he had that he could have only had uh, being divine. And yet in comparison to that, uh, Jesus knew that Nathaniel and the other disciples would be witnessing over the next three years ago a whole lot more. And it was pretty much like, like telling uh, Nathaniel and the others that were around, it's like, you guys ain't seen nothing yet. And what we're going to see is, as we continue, we see you, that, that Jesus... Um, the first use of two phrases we see a lot in the gospel in that verse and one of them is most assuredly I say to you it appears 25 times in the gospel now there's lots of other ways it was translated um, and I, I remember growing up with the, the King James and it said verily verily I say unto you I have no idea what that meant guys <laughs> um, other translations say truly truly I say to you I tell you the solemn truth truly truly I say to you all Maybe Jesus was a southerner. Um, another one in the translation says, I guarantee this truth. And then, of course, the verily, verily, I say unto you in the King James and Amplified, which, you know, really lays out the, the deep meanings there is, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you all. So when you see that phrase, no matter how it's translated in the version you're reading, you know, I, I think, you know, this is it. This is something to listen to. This is for everybody, and it's the absolute truth. Every time that he says that, there's something else in there, and that's the undeniable link to the Jewish faith that he was a part of and the Hebrew scriptures that are the roots that, that we dig into. Because even though the text is in Greek, the, the same word that was used there was also used in the Greek and the Hebrew and in just about every other language. And I think you all know a little bit of Greek and Hebrew. How many of y'all know Greek and Hebrew in here? Okay. The exact word was amen, amen. May have been a little different uh, dialect, a little different uh, um, accent to it. Amen, amen. I've, seen, I've heard it in a lot of languages, but amen, amen. When you start out a sentence in amen, amen in the Hebrew, um, you know, that means something different. At the, at the end when we use it at the end of a prayer or in response to somebody's telling the truth, we, we say, man, it's like, so be it, or let it be so, or, you know, that's the truth. But at the beginning of a phrase, you know, it means, listen up, this is the truth, this is something you all need to hear. So what's so interesting about the phrase when he says, amen, 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 amen at the beginning, 
of a phrase. It's, it's like starting it out with an exclamation point. So again, I'm going through a lot here to tell you about this because we're going to see it constantly and I'm only going to explain it one time. So <laughs> if you, when you hear that phrase, take notes. Okay, Jesus is saying, write this down. This is something you really want to be important. It's, uh, it's kind of like the, what I call life lessons, takeaways that you really want to absorb and, and put into your life. And so uh, that's the Bible study tip you get for today is when you see Jesus using amen, amen, or any of the translations, take notes, dig in. There's a lot in there. Now, the other phrase you'll find that he uses there, you'll find over 80 times in all the Gospels. And the phrase is the Son of Man the Son of Man. To a casual reader, it might seem pretty odd. After all, didn't Nathaniel just say, you are the Son of God? Right to Jesus' face. And you know, Jesus didn't even deny it. He didn't say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm the Son of Man. I'm, I'm just a person. I'm just a prophet. You know, I'm just a wise sage. I'm just a guy on the hilltop meditating. No, he didn't say any of that because he may have been wise and a prophet and and uh, you know, bringing God's truth, but he was indeed the son of God. But in fact, in his statement to Nathaniel, he refers to himself as son of man. And we know that Jesus was fully God by the verses we've studied already. And um, what we'll see as we continue is that the people that Jesus was talking to in his day really did understand when he said the son of man referring to himself, he was talking, he was claiming to be God in the flesh. Okay, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. That's his, in, he was on the mission to earth as a man. His humility, I mean, he was humble. How do you be God and be humble at the same time? That was tough for Jesus. I mean, for anybody, it would be, for me especially. I mean, if I was God, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be saying, oh, yeah, I, I'd say, I'm God, y'all, listen up. But he referred to himself as the son of man. He didn't talk about it being the Messiah, the everlasting prince, prince of peace, the son of God. But again, back in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, we see uh, where Daniel wrote, I saw the night visions, and behold, on the clouds of heaven came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And there was given him the Messiah, dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. So there's no question that this phrase, Son of Man, was referring to the Messiah, the Son of God. Um, and he may have liked to refer to himself as Son of Man, again, to make you think a little deeper. Um, here, I, although I could, I just encourage you guys, look it up. Um, use DuckDuckGo or Google if it's, if it's accurate this time. <laughs> and dig in and find out, you know, son of man, what does that mean? And then and look for the scriptural references. A lot of stuff. Volumes have been written about it. Uh, so I'm going to just leave it there. Just trust me on that one. <laughs> Back to verse 51. Jesus said, Hereafter you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending a man upon the son of man. It wasn't just to Nathaniel and Philip, who we already read were, were standing there, but also to others. There were people that were already following Jesus wherever he went to hear what he was saying. And it, they wrote it down so that we could hear it, which means that it applies to us as well. Like so many things in this book, in the Gospel of John and, and in the whole Bible indeed, um, we, there are multiple meanings in a lot of cases, and it's really cool to, to dig in. And, um, but in this verse, no matter what meaning you take, it means supernatural things are going to happen. Uh, but something that reminded me of was, he's talking about angels ascending and descending. What in the Old Testament, early in the Old Testament, do you recall hearing that happening? Anybody want to jump in there? I didn't tell you I was going to give you a pop quiz today, did I? <laughs> Genesis 28, 12 to 14. Uh, it's about Jacob. He had a dream. And it said, he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on earth and its top reached to heaven. And there were angels of God who were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was pretty supernatural. 
So that's what it reminded me of. And, and I'm sure the disciples were thinking of, you know, oh, Jacob, yeah, he, angels ascended and descended. Um, I'm sure they were thinking of that when they saw a few years later, or, you know, months later, the transfiguration where Moses and, and uh, Elijah appeared with Jesus. They weren't angels, but it's, again, a supernatural event happening from heaven or, or a few, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead. He saw Jesus ascending into heaven, and then angels were there, had descended, and were telling them, hey, that same Jesus you just saw go up into heaven, he's going to come back again, same way. So tell them how he, how he would return. And, and doubtless, many other times, as um, the Apostle John supposed, that the world could not contain all the books that were written about what Jesus did here. When the, when the disciples saw these miracles that Jesus performed, it would have seemed like angels were coming and going all the time. So it was kind of a, kind of a cool situation. Today, it doesn't happen anymore, right? God doesn't perform miracles. We don't ever see anything that God does here. Is that right? <laughs> Y'all look at me like, is he crazy? Well, yes, today we see glimpses of God's glory and the working of our lives. You know, the more we let him do, the more we look for these things, the more we see these things. Um, when, when I, I just love to meet people who are open to the Lord working in their life and doing amazing things because there are things orchestrated in heaven that we can't put together and we know God's put together. Miraculous blessings that come into our lives that Jesus does and, and angels that have protected us, angels that have you know, guided us and others too. We don't ever see with our human eyes, but if we just are open to God's spirit, we'll see that happening. So our first life, life lesson today, first life lesson is watch for miracles as Jesus works in people and circumstances around you and give God the glory for it. Watch for miracles as Jesus works in people and circumstances around you and give God all the glory. Now, I love how the Bible opens up the heavens for a few minutes and then brings you right back to where you live. Because the next verses we jump into bring us right down to earth Jesus and his disciples going a few miles over a hill to a common experience that most all of us have experienced. John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 is a text and I'll read them and go through them as we uh, come to each verse. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So this was the third day that Jesus had been recognized publicly as the Messiah um, the first day was his baptism. Second day, we saw how a lot of people began following him. And the third day, Jesus and his followers attended a wedding feast. Now, a Jewish wedding feast was huge. But it was really cool to see this is something, you know, Jesus uh, and his disciples pretty much approved of and blessed marriage. Okay? Uh, a lot of people don't like that nowadays. It's a weird society. I'm sorry. It just, but, you know, we see Jesus blesses marriage and accepts that. The same way that a baptism, when you're baptized, you publicly commit and signify that you're com you've come to repentance and you're going to follow God. And the same way that accepting Jesus' call on your life is a public commitment. I'm just telling people, I'm gonna do what God's called me to do. So is a wedding, a public commitment to a faithful fidelity uh, between a man and a woman and uh, in, in marriage. So. Um, all of these things are very similar, and we see them taking place right, right in a row here. Uh, they're really pieces that God has for, all man, for, for mankind and um, the overall plan. When we see how much he loves these things, uh, we, we see him working in our lives and, and how we can please him too. Now, uh, geographically, this wedding feast takes place in Cana of Galilee. I love how the Bible gives us information that is... Um, it's not like they made up words, they made up names, they made up places, <laughs> they made up situations. It's not a fiction book. It's 100% true and verifiable. Cana was a real place. Everyone initially reading what John wrote knew it. They knew where it was. Uh, today, there's not much left to it. The town's in ruins, but it's, and it's called Karabet Cana, and it's in Israel. It's uh, about eight or nine miles northeast of Nazareth. It was a small town, but there's a lot of people packed into that small town. Um, I couldn't find exactly how small it was. We learned last week that Nazareth was uh, about the size of sections A and B over here, with the population probably slightly more than A and B. 
but uh, Cana relied on, on agriculture. Uh, when, they, when they dug things up around there, they, they started finding these things. A few years back, they found a synagogue. They found houses that were built into the hillsides. There was a complex that was made, out, that made of a number of different caves, kind of like a convention center almost, which was interesting. Um, and even a large number of uh, rock cut cisterns where the rainwater was stored um, in, in the town. And there was even tombs in there. So uh, people you know, lived and died in Cana for, for a number of years. All of the things, all of the things they found back up the scriptural account of the wedding and what happened there. So in, in, in fact, in John so far, we've seen eight different places specifically mentioned that these things were happening in. The country of Israel, Jerusalem, Bethabara, also known as, uh, I mean, excuse me, Bethabara was also known as uh, Bethany or Bet-Anya, uh, the Jordan River, Galilee, Bethsaida or Bethsaida, it's a little bit different spelling, or Nazareth or Nazri, the, the desert wilderness area, and now Cana of Galilee. I mean, today, we're 1,990 years later. Um, I don't think Kernersville, anybody will recognize it 2,000 years from now. But here we are, almost 2,000 years after these events took place, and you can see these places, you can walk there, you can walk the street, you can visit the very places that, this thing, that the Bible is talking about. So our life lesson is you can trust the Bible to be accurate and true. You can trust the Bible to be accurate and true. Now, again, Jesus and his, his disciples were all invited to attend the festivities. Um, again, suffice to say, a wedding was a Jewish wedding was a major event. It wasn't like you know a stop on your schedule. We're going to go down to uh, Harris Teeter, and then we're going to go to the wedding, and then we're going to go over to uh, Lowe's Hardware Store. No, no, it was like days. It might be you might go for a day, but you might go for days and days. It was a, a long celebration. And it was a town that was really close to where Jesus grew up and where uh, him and Mary, his mother, lived. It's likely that it was probably one of their friends, uh, uh, maybe someone in their extended family that was getting married. We're not told that wasn't that important to, to the, the story. But what's not obvious is uh, why the disciples were invited to go also. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that his mother, Mary, was probably in on the planning and uh, in, on some of the arrangements, possibly responsible for some of the arrangements for this big celebration. And that would explain why Jesus was, uh, not, not only him, he was invited, but also his disciples were invited. And you'll see um, a little more here as we, as we look at where Mary says in verse 3, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, They have no wine. Now, some say that the family may have been poor and couldn't afford all the provisions for all the guests. Or maybe that since Jesus came and his disciples were invited, maybe there were a lot more disciples following him than they'd planned for. And, uh, you know, with the number of people, there was more that was being consumed. Um, it could have been a hint. Someone said, well, maybe, maybe Mary was saying, hey, there's no more wine. It's time to leave, you know. Celebration's about over. I don't think so. I think there's a little more to this, okay? Jesus said to her, and from, from Jesus' response in verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Is that any way to talk to your mother? <laughs> that was not disrespectful. It is. She's like, yes, that's the way to talk to your mother. <laughs> well, you know, the way that Mary talked to him, I mean, he, he's been with her for 30 years. He knows when Mary says, son, ain't no wine there. He knew that she was saying, fix it. <laughs> and she, she knew some other things too. Okay, Mary probably figured out with all these disciples following Jesus, he'd been revealed as the Messiah just a few days earlier uh, by John the Baptist. He, she could, he could show all of the family and friends that for the past 30 years, she was telling the truth. She was a virgin when she conceived uh, Jesus. I mean, a divine miracle would show that he's divine, that, that this could happen. Um, you know, she was going through all that. Um, but Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. Now, 
When he said that, and then I see what happens in the next verses, you know, we, we know who have you read the story, we know this miracle was going to happen. So why did Jesus say, my hour is not yet come, but then he went ahead and did the miracle? What's this hour he's talking about? Okay. Let's dig a little deeper. Here we are digging and digging, right? Ten times more in John, we read about his hour. And I'm just going to say the verse re references because I don't have time to read them all. But in John 4, 21, he's speaking of the time immediately after his final sacrifice of the Lamb of God will be made. Talking about the hour which is yet to come. Um, in John 5, 28, uh, 5, 25 and 28, he talks about the hour coming when he could proclaim life and resurrection to the faithful who had died before he came, but they believed in the promise of his coming. Then in John 7, 30, we see that although his teaching was infuriating some of the people that he was talking to and some of the leaders that, that refused to believe him and they wanted to do away with him, it said they were powerless because his hour had not yet come. Okay, so there's something different about this hour than just saying, it's not time for me to do something special. In John 12, 23, 27, and John 13, 1, we see the scriptures say, the hour has come. At that point, he starts saying, the hour has come. John 12, 27, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So we're seeing right before Jesus is crucified, buried, resurrected. He's talking about this hour has come. Okay, these other passages help us understand that Jesus wasn't saying that the times for miraculous signs had not come yet. He was saying that the positive, undeniable, infallible proof that he was divine and God was honoring his ministry on earth, what Mary wanted everybody to see, that would come later. So it was kind of like, Mom, not yet. Not yet, Mom. It wasn't like, I don't like you, Mom. <laughs> uh, now, if you're from a background that says that you should go and ask Mary for things and she'll tell Jesus what to do, guess what? You need to adjust that thinking. I grew up in a, in a small town where there's a lot of people that would pray to Mary and ask her for favors. Well, I'm looking. We see Jesus loved his mother. He respected her. He even made sure when he was, when he was dying, he was 33 years old. He was long out of the house <laughs> by that time. Um, you see, he even made sure that she was taken care of after his death. So there was no disrespect there at all. But you see, from the very beginning of his ministry, we see that he doesn't take orders from her. How does that affect our, our thoughts about praying? Um, you don't need to ask Mary to tell Jesus what to do, okay? Um, that's not how God asked us to ask him for favors or for his favor. Even Mary knew that 2,000 years ago because we, 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 we read Mary's last words in the Bible were not, um, Jesus, do it. I told you to do it. I'm your mother. He didn't, she didn't do that. She says in verse 5, it says, His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. He didn't, she didn't say anything else to Jesus at that point. Just told the ones around him, if he asked you to do something, go ahead. Just trust him. Guess what? Best advice ever. <laughs> Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Are you having trouble figuring out a, a problem in your life? Whatever Jesus says to you to do, do it. If you're hitting up against roadblocks in your life, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Have you been doing things your own way and it's just not working out? What do you want? You plan to do it. Well, do it. Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. Are you asking everyone else questions? Look to the source of all wisdom and all knowledge that we've seen in our passages so far. And whatever Jesus says to you, just do it. Guess what a life lesson is? Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. I got to remember that, so I got to say it over and over. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Most of the time, you're not going to get the whole plan when he tells you things. You may not even get part of the plan. You may not even know have a clue what the plan is. But as we are obedient to Jesus in each step of the way, we eventually see the miracle he's doing in our life. And it's a good thing too, because one thing would probably freak us out to know what God is doing in our lives. Um, and 
Another thing is, if he gave us the whole plan, then we would go and do the plan and we'd say, look how good we are. Look what we did. And that's not why Jesus does these good things in our lives, these miracles in our lives. So let's see what Jesus says to the servant. Verse 6. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Okay, that was step one. Probably the hardest one. Um, used to be stronger than I, than I am now, but you know, water pot, just the water in each of those six pots would weigh between 165 and 250 pounds. I might could have struggled with picking those up when I was younger, but then you had the weight of the jars. They were carved out of stone, it says. Probably a um, foot, foot and a half wide, probably about four or five feet tall. Fill them with water. Probably three, four hundred, you know, probably close to 300 pounds a piece um, when they're filled up. So they're very heavy. Now we read about in the archeology span where the cistern, they had cisterns in Cana that were filled with water since there wasn't a spring to feed the to feed the, any wells there. So that's why they had the cisterns catching rainwater. And all those cisterns, they found about 60 of them when they were uh, digging things up. Plenty of water, plenty of supplies to, to provide those uh, 120 to 180 gallons of water to fill those six pots. So again, verifying what the scripture's saying. But getting the water either to the, from the cisterns to the pots or taking the pots to the cisterns, filling them up, that's a big job. Okay, now if you're wondering why they had these large water pots sitting around, um, remember there wasn't running water, okay? They didn't even have a, a camper space where you could help hook up your hose and, and, and run water into your tank. You, you had to go get your own water for the tank. You had to go down the river. Um, if the river was close by, there was no river close by, but they had these uh, cisterns that were catching water. So these were most likely, since they were close and they were large, they were most likely the pots that were being used for the ceremonial and practical hand washing for the bride and groom during the wedding. Now don't get grossed out yet, okay? Because we all know what's coming next. But remember the purified water, that purified water and each person drinking from a different cup and sterilizing, washing, sterilizing bowls and utensils and all that stuff, these are all 20th century innovations to protect us from contamination, okay? Before that, people didn't think about that. Um, I mean, still, it's not unusual in third world countries. I, I've been in countries and in situations where, you know, I'd see the cistern where water was dumped into it, and then they'd wash their clothes in it, and then they'd wash their hands in it after working a day at work, and then they'd grab the family cup and dip water out and drink it and put it right back. That still goes on today. So that's what they were for. Um, but it was pretty common, so it's not, not something that's like grossing out, it's just the way they did things. Anyway, step one was getting the water, then there was step two in, in verse eight, and he, Jesus said to them, draw some out now. Once they had done that first step, he said, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. I can see these servants now, you know, taking this water to the master of the feast. They had no idea what was gonna happen. Probably wondered why they were uh, supposed to take him water. Why would we do that? Somewhere along the line, between the time they probably dipped a ladle of water out of one of the pots and put it up to the feast master's lips, it changed from water that had rained down from heaven to wine. And probably the servants were the first to notice it. You ever think about that? You know, it's like, hold it, hold it, that was water. I just, what's going on here? And then they saw the feast master start to, to taste of it and drink it. He loved it. So this is really, really good stuff. Um, they realized that something miraculous had happened. They knew that Jesus had told them to do things. The feast master didn't. Well, let me just read what it says in verse 9. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Verse 10, and he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. So we see Jesus here not only meets our needs, but when, we, when Jesus meets our needs, it's not a makeshift second-class solution. It's the best. 
When you obey God, you can expect that the end result of following him and obeying what he tells you to do is better than anything that we could have planned for. I mean, even the bridegroom, if he had made the plans and gotten plenty and plenty of the, the wine and the food and the other things for the festivities, it wouldn't have been any better at the end than at the beginning. But it was because Jesus made it happen. Romans 8, 28 tells us, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, sometimes people who aren't following Jesus will, will try to claim all things work together for good. Now, ever hear that from somebody, you know they weren't following the Lord and there, something was going on and oh, all things are gonna work together for good. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Sorry to break it to you, brothers and sisters, but that's, you gotta read the whole part of it, you know, the whole passage. It says specifically to those who love God, that is respect him, adore him, obey him, follow him. And number two, those who are called according to his purpose. Jesus has a purpose for each one of us. When he calls, do you answer? What do you answer <laughs> when he calls? I mean, people call me on the phone all the time. Better make sure it's off or they'll call me right now and ask, sell me a warranty. But do you say, I'm, I'm busy now, I'll call you back later. Or when God calls for you to do something, you say, oh, hold on, I'll get to you after I've done the rest of my own things. Or do we say, God, I'll, I'll get back to you, this is a bad time right now. You know, I suggest to you today that none of these things really qualify you for inclusion in his promise. Love God, and when he calls according to his purpose, you go ahead and follow him, obey him. See these things work together for good in your life. And our life lesson is when we follow Jesus and obey him in faith, we know he will take care of us. When we follow Jesus and obey him in faith, he will take care of us. Now, another thing we notice here in the passage is who gets the credit? We touched on that briefly. Uh, the bridegroom is praised for serving, saving the best for last. Never seen anything like this before, buddy. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. You've got the good stuff now. And everybody's going to be even happier than they were before because they got the best wine. And uh, the, it doesn't say that the groom corrected them. But I bet there was a really weird look on his face because <laughs> he knew he hadn't done that. He had no idea what was going on. Now, the servants, they did a lot of the work. But they knew that they hadn't performed the miracle. But the bottom line is... You know, as a servant, it really doesn't matter. If you're serving someone, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is that the person who is your master gets the glory. For us, it's important that God gets the glory. And even if credit is given in our direction, it should be redirected to him. Um, I, I've tried to, to make it a habit in my life when someone says something that's good, that they've seen happen in my life or that I've done. I just, you know, I, I've tried to say, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. And yes, I'm giving him glory, but I'm also redirecting the glory to him because if there's anything good coming from my life, it is him. It's not me. It's not coming from me. So our life lesson is when you obey Jesus, you can't take the credit for the results. Give God all the glory. When you obey Jesus, you can't take credit for the results. Give God the glory. See, Jesus and his mom and his disciples that all knew what happened. They saw the glory of God revealed and and we see even in uh, verse 11, it says, The beginnings of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Even though Jesus was glorious on earth, he didn't keep the glory for himself. We see him time and time deflecting that glory to his Father in heaven. Even when he prays the night before he's crucified, he says in John 17, 4 and 5, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Now, we'll, we'll study it out when we get into John 17. Uh, brother, it might be five years from now. But, but we see that Jesus was, was ready and willing to give his life for ours. And he affirms to the Father that he had brought glory to him through his obedience. Uh, in the work he was assigned. And now he's asking the Father to take him back into the glory they shared before eternity. Uh, on earth, it's wonderful to see God working in our lives um, and in the lives of others that are following Jesus too. Isn't it cool to see the stories of what God is doing in people's lives and, and hear them tell and give glory, glory to God. But we do, we all do have a longing. And I think as we, as we grow in our, our faith and we grow in our, our time and our lives, 
that we're longing more and more to spend that eternity with the one uh, who deserves all the credit, all the praise, and all the glory. So let me circle back to, to Nathaniel, where we started out this morning. The things that Jesus had told Nathaniel the day before, just the day before, were already taking place. Supernatural activities were happening, happening, things greater than he had seen before. To put an exclamation point on it, Jesus performed this first miracle right in Nathaniel's hometown, in his backyard, Cana. Now, whether or not the other guests realized what was happening, we, we're not told that the guests all got up and thank you, Jesus, for doing this. We don't see that happening. But I'm sure Nate was thinking, ain't nothing ever happened like this in Cana before. <laughs> and the result was, the Bible tells us the result was that his disciples believed in him. Now, why focus on Jesus' disciples believing in him? You ever think about that? As a disciple or follower, they were learning from him. They were making notes of his teaching. They were, he was teaching them. That's the relationship in being a follower and a teacher. But as we, we discussed before, believing is the key to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. As the Amplified Bible so aptly phrases it in John 1, 12, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, the power, the privilege, and the right to become the children of God, that is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, rely on his name. What we're seeing here is those who have chosen to follow Jesus and to become his disciples, not only need to learn to listen and learn from his teaching, but they need to actually believe in him, trust in, adhere to, rely on, him and his name. This is essential and they can only carry out the work God has given them in life if they do that. Yes, it's not just enough to know who Jesus is, what he does, and believe that he did the things that we have good documentation that he's done, but we must truly believe in him before we can expect those around us and those that we point to Jesus to also believe in him. Life lesson here is simple, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I, I know I've gone a slightly bit longer than usual today, but there's one more incredible thing, and I'll at least mention it here. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll post on the Facebook page a link um, that, that goes into a few details. I thought something was really cool that I found. And that is, in, in chapter 1, we see Jesus was in the beginning, and all things were made through him. And we saw that whole process, by jumping back into Genesis, we saw that whole process take six days in the book of Genesis. God was the witness, and he's the one that told us that. And unless he tells me something different, I'm going to believe him. And he had written it down so we could all know about it. And we see here in the very next chapter, in chapter 2, Jesus, with plenty of people as witnesses, in an instant, like that, without even saying a word, calls plain water to turn into the best wine. Now, I'm not a wine grower or a, I, I, I don't even drink wine, um, traditional wine, but I researched a little bit and I found out that it takes two to seven years to grow the vines that will produce grapes for wine. Then the basic process of harvesting, and pressing, and fermenting, and aging begins, and that may last through all the process uh, another year, maybe two, before the wine is ready for storage to be the best it can be. And so the process takes from three to nine years. Jesus made it happen faster than that, without saying a word. Now, what's more difficult? Making all things in creation in six days, or making wine from 100 gallons of water, 150 gallons of water, simultaneously in separate containers in an instant? I don't think there's much difference in it. I think that's God, that's his power. I want to encourage you to get to know and believe in Jesus more and more, not just who he is, who, who others say he is, what he's done. Get to know him personally. Many of you do, but, but continue to read, study, and ask for information, ask for wisdom to understand God's word. So when you see Jesus working, you'll know him and truly believe in him. Intentionally pray, read God's word, love God, find ways to serve him, and your faith will grow. Hebrews 11.6 tells us, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Take that in your hearts, brothers and sisters. Next week, we'll pick up in verse 12 
And we'll see what happens when true righteousness meets the fakers, the ones that are just playing games. So if you have any questions about beginning a, or renewing a relationship with the Lord, or if there's anything you'd like for us to pray with you about, now's a great time to, uh, don't hesitate to ask Mitzi or myself, and we'll pray together as we finish fellowshipping today. And uh, right now, I want to thank you for being here again, some of you, most of you, and uh, I'd like to ask the Lord to bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.